Hey, everybody, and welcome in to another episode of True Crime Tales. I am your host, Jeff Nadu. If you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button. And if you enjoy our content and never want to miss another video, always hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit that notification bell too. Let's get into another tale. And I have to admit, most of the true crime cases I cover definitely hit me a little bit. We all have family, whether it's sisters, brothers, nieces, or nephews, mothers or fathers. Today's case hit incredibly home to me due to the fact that it is about a young woman and I have a sister. Before I get started, I want to say, as always, rest in peace to the woman in this case, and may her memory be a blessing to her family. Karina Vetrano was born July 12th, 1986, and she was from the leafy, beautiful neighborhood of Howard Beach, Queens. Her parents were Kathy and Philip Vetrano. Now, Phil was a retired New York City firefighter and was actually a first responder on that fateful day, September 11th, 2001. Karina would be raised alongside a brother called Eddie and a sister called Tana. The Vetranos were a normal Italian family living in a beautiful, picturesque neighborhood with well-groomed lawns. Howard Beach is a place where any person would love to grow up. It's bordered by beautiful waterways, nice parks, and bucolic living. It was said that Karina Vetrano was particularly close to her father, Phil. They would exercise together and even travel. Karina would graduate from Archbishop Malloy High School and eventually head to St. John's, where she would down the road, graduate, and then get a master's degree in speech pathology. It was said that Karina Vetrano was a speech pathologist for children with autism in Manhattan. She was a beautiful and successful woman. Karina Vetrano would also maintain a side employment at a restaurant and lounge called Vetro, not far from her home. It was said that Karina Vetrano enjoyed jogging and staying in shape, traveling with her friends, and even writing. She at one point would even act in a small film in 2013. One thing, as I said, Karina loved to do was jog. She was beautiful and loved to stay in shape. And it was said that she would regularly enjoy jogging with her father, Phil, but that he had recently had issues with his back and in and around 2016, stopped jogging with her. Now, Phil Vetrano would tell his daughter quite regularly that she probably shouldn't jog on her own, but she did anyway. Karina, Karina would run in the area of Spring Creek Park, not far from her home. Now, if you know anything about Howard Beach, Spring Creek Park lands on the southern region of Howard Beach, essentially bordering the area of 165th Avenue and 83rd Street. On April, sorry, on August 2nd, 2016, Katrina Vetrano, Karina Vetrano, around 5 p.m. that day, would take her normal jog near Spring Creek Park not far from her home. That day, her dad did not jog with her. Here she can be seen just moments before she entered Spring Creek Park on a running trail. Now, but an hour after she had left for her jog, her parents began worrying. They began calling and texting her, but to no avail. Her family would then notify members of the NYPD, most notably an individual called John Russo, who lived not far from the family home. Mr. Russo would then get in contact with his NYPD brethren, and a search would begin, including Phil Vetrano, who began scouring the area near his home. About six hours later, 
Sadly, Phil Vetrana would come up on an absolutely grisly and violent scene. He would find his daughter face down on a trail in the park. Her breasts were exposed. Her running shorts were pulled down. She was scratched, bruised, beaten, and sadly even s aid. She had multiple marks on her neck, back, and legs, as well as cuts, bruises, and scratches. Karina's death was ruled a homicide, and the cause of death was strangulation. I do want to talk about the fight that Karina Vetrano would put up. She didn't go down without one. It was said that she was repeatedly punched in the head and struck with a rock, and that she had bit the individual that killed her so hard that her teeth cracked. Now, DNA would be found under the fingerprints of Karina Vetrano. It was not only found there, but it was also found on her back and a phone found close to the scene that belonged to Miss Vetrano. There were over 600 samples taken and 250 leads were tracked down. Sadly, though, no matches came back and no suspects were found. After nearly six months after the death of Katrina Vetrano, a sketch was posted by the NYPD. This is the man they would say possibly killed Miss Vetrano. Now, a witness, a man, said he reported an individual coming out of the weeds and running down the Belt Parkway. Now, we can contend initially the witness didn't know if this individual was the person, but he may be a person of interest. Now, in February of 2017, this individual, a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old male called Channel Lewis, was taken into custody from his home in East New York, just two and a half miles from the bucolic area of Howard Beach. Now, it was said that Channel Lewis was unemployed and living with his mother. It was said also that Mr. Lewis was described by police as a loner and mentally unstable. Now, keep in mind, upon the arrest of Mr. Lewis, he would willingly give DNA and give statements to police, including the fact of describing a very peculiar, peculiar puddle of muddy water near the body of Katrina Vetrano. Now, keep in mind, Mr. Lewis had no criminal record, but he reportedly had a, quote, hatred for women, and once told a teacher that he wanted to stab all the girls in his school. Now, keep in mind how close East New York is to Howard Beach. That's one of the reasons I left um, the map on the screen. Notice where Howard Beach is. To the south, you see Green Area. To the southeast, you see Howard Beach. So not far at all. Channel Lewis, though, was seemingly a loner. That's not to, though, believe that he killed Miss Vetrano. The problem that he did, though, also have was, A, in early 2016, he had been given multiple summons for violating park rules at Spring Creek Park, and then he possibly and very much looked like the individual in this sketch. There were several damning things about Channel Lewis. And the NYPD contended that his DNA was a match. Now, we'll get into some of the particulars that went on in court. Now, several people believe that this was a racial incident and that Mr. Lewis was essentially a scapegoat. And they had very little to actually bring him in. Now, I want to bring back John Russo. John Russo is said to be the individual that uh, was a member of the NYPD that lived close to uh, the Vetranos that assisted in finding Mr. Lewis. He would claim that months before the murder, he had actually witnessed Mr. Lewis 
in Howard Beach and that for 45 minutes he pursued him off duty. And then a day later, he spotted him again, took him into custody in far Rockaway, Queens, and that they questioned him at one point as to why he was moving around and acting weird. And he also said that he had witnessed Mr. Lewis very suspicious in the area and that when they arrested Mr. Lewis, he had remembered back to this uh, suspect. And that's one of the reasons they brought him in as a person of interest. So there were definitely some problems for Mr. Lewis in this case. Now, police would say also that Channel Lewis's subsequent meeting to Karina Vetrana was completely random. And that his mother would also state, Vita Lewis, that upon home that evening in August 2016, his mother would claim that Channel Lewis's clothes were often ripped, but that they were also disheveled and that he looked disheveled. He would say that to his mother that he was mugged reportedly, but the MIPD had no record and believed that that never actually happened. A day later, after the subsequent murder date, his father would reportedly take him to a local hospital where he was treated for scratches, cuts, and bruises on his body. Now, at one point, as I said, Channel Lewis would also willingly talk to the police in which he gave what they said was a confession. He said that he punched Miss Vetrano multiple times and that he got madder and madder as he did what he did. Now, in the subsequent months after the fact, a trial would start. In November of 2018, a forensic biologist would testify that the DNA that they said belonged to Mr. Lewis had a one in six trillion chance of someone else sharing a genetic profile. So that was very unlikely. Now, a doctor who performed the autopsy would describe Ms. Vetrano's injuries, including a compressed carotid artery in her neck. Now, keep in mind, there were all sorts of witnesses in this case, police and others. I must contend, and this is important to state in this case, there is also a lot of DNA. We know that. Mr. Lewis's defense team would say that he, quote, bumped into her that day, which seems incredibly coincidental with all the other things, plus the fact that he identified certain things about the landscape of the area. Also involving Channel Lewis was a phone discovered in a dresser in his bedroom that had some pretty odd web searches and photographs. Among the cached images related to web searches taken from his phone were two photos of Vetrano as well as a snapshot of the crime scene in Spring Creek Park in subsequent news articles. They would also find searches related to the legal process as well as constitutional rights. Now, remember, the user of the phone was not identified as Mr. Lewis. However, the phone was located in his home in his dresser. Searches were also Googled the word arraignment and looked up news articles about familial DNA testing, which uses genetic material from relatives to arrest a suspect. Now, also, in addition to the searches, there was a photograph of a hand injury that we could garner was from Mr. Lewis. Keep in mind, during his confession, he mentions multiple times that he hit Miss Vetrano. This is all very damning evidence to Mr. Lewis. That said, on November 21st, 2018, the judge in this case would declare a mistrial. Remember, there was a lot of evidence, DNA against Mr. Lewis. However, there was no hair, blood, footprints, or genetic fluid from Mr. Not genetic fluid, but um, uh, bodily fluids from Mr. Lewis. Now, it was contended that Miss Vetrano was SA'd. So there would probably be some sort of body fluid or hair or something. That was not discovered in this case. However, there was damning DNA. 
The mistrial was granted due to the fact mostly from arguments made as well as the DNA possibly being contaminated. Now, retrial for Channel Lewis was scheduled to begin in January of 2019. However, it would ultimately start in March of 2019. After five hours of deliberation on April 1st, 2019, a verdict was in. Channel Lewis would subsequently be found guilty on one count of first degree murder, second degree murder, and S.A. Vetrano supporters would erupt in applause and happiness. They had finally gotten the animal that brutally killed Karina Vetrano. Now, subsequently to the guilty verdict, Chanel Lewis would be sentenced on April 23rd, 2019 to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, as I said, there have been varied opinions about Channel Lewis's guilt. Obviously, the family and friends of Miss Vetrano believe he is guilty, and so do I. There is damning evidence against Mr. Lewis. I will just contend this. There is one video of when Mr. Lewis is arrested being paraded out in front of cameras like they normally do in New York as a suspect leaves a police precinct. I don't know the mental acuity of Mr. Lewis. However, it does seem like he is a bit unstable. I'm not going to say I don't believe or trust what the government or state of New York did in this case. I believe he killed Miss Lewis or Miss uh, Vetrano. But Mr. Lewis has had people come to his defense, including his mother, Vita Lewis. She would claim to this day he is innocent and that she would also insist that he was, quote, wrongfully convicted and a scapegoat for the NYPD. Now, the jury foreman in this case would say that beyond a reasonable doubt, all 12 of the jurors agreed in unison that Mr. Lewis was indeed guilty. Also, the former New York City Police Department Commissioner Robert Boyce said that the evidence and conviction was a, quote, no doubter. Vita Lewis would also say that her son was, quote, helpless and that he was unable to commit a murder of this magnitude. Channel Lewis is currently 27 years old and currently incarcerated at Five Points Correctional Facility near Ithaca, New York. It must be made clear that Channel Lewis is rightfully someone who can appeal his conviction. His attorney, Ron Kuby, would claim that there are various things that the NYPD did that made down the road get him some sort of appeal. It remains to be seen whether that will happen. The truth of the matter is, a jury of Channel Lewis's peers found beyond a reasonable doubt that he is a depraved animal that killed a woman in cold blood for reasons we have no idea for. He should die in state prison. It's that simple. Today, July 12th, 2023, Karina Vetrano would be 30 years old. I did this show on this day to honor her memory. May she rest in peace and her memory be a blessing to our family. We'll see you next week here on True Crime Tip.